Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Damien Wisniewski. I'm an enterprise sales manager here for the for the West Coast for LinkedIn. Um, for those of you here in person, there is uh, plenty of food in the back, uh, still plenty of coffee. As I mentioned before, we just uh, opened our new amazing LinkedIn cafe this week. So a lot of great new free, tasty Silicon Valley food. Um, I've been here four years now, so I'm, I'm a massive old timer by, uh, by LinkedIn standards. When I started, we had about 450 employees, and by the end of this year, we'll have 4,500. Um, so for me, the topic of, of employment branding is, is huge, actually, because when I started, I had no idea. I was doing my entire job search on LinkedIn, and I had no clue that there was a business-to-business -business component uh, of LinkedIn services, because at the time, you know, 2009, we were still getting talent solutions up and running. There were not that many salespeople in the U.S., so they had to reach out to me. I didn't know to reach out to LinkedIn uh, because I had no awareness that there were jobs here that I was interested in doing. So now, flash forward four years, I've helped hire over 50 salespeople for LinkedIn, have seen a complete transformation, know that you know, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, we're known as being a top employer of salespeople. So they're coming to us, in addition to us going out and finding the best, but they know to come to us because they know we're here. So we've gone from having an employment branding problem to having an employment brand. So uh, as a hiring manager, I find it to be extremely helpful to, that people know who we are and also what we stand for as an employer. And my ability to go out and say things like, well, you know, we're still very startup-y. If you want stability, you can go to this company, this company, this company. But if you want career tra tra trajectory and the possibility of, you know, moving up quickly or doing three different things in three different years, we're still the place. All, all a very important part of getting the right people onto my team, into LinkedIn, good culture fit, and hiring, you know, an amazing, an amazing team. So for me, this is a very important topic and makes my life as a hiring manager at LinkedIn so much easier than it would be otherwise. Um, so to talk more in depth about this, we've got uh, Jake Ruby, one of our top reps from the Chicago office. Jake, come on up. And uh, he will take you through uh, what LinkedIn has learned through its own transformation of, of employment brand and how we how we use it and speak about it here internally and why we think it's important enough for uh, for us to run around um, and and put on presentations like this all over the US to make sure that uh, uh, we get the word out and so that you know people learn how to do this for their own companies and then we've got some uh, local success stories right here in the Bay Area that will uh, talk about their experiences so thank you very much Jake right. appreciate it sure. here we go Oh, awesome. and uh, actually, one, one more thing before we get started. Sorry, I forgot these things. Um, this will be, again, for the folks in the room. But we are LinkedIn. We're a big data company, so we like to do some, uh, some data things. So we've got, uh, for folks here, just come on up afterwards uh, if, if you're a winner. Um, we've got uh, the earliest adopter will be uh, Wayne Janis. He's, he's the first person in the room to sign up for LinkedIn, um, the most connected. Ted McCauley, very good. Uh, most popular, BJT, very nice. And then finally, the most endorsed, Timothy Calhoun. So um, as to not interrupt the, uh, the online portion, we'll just ask you to come up afterwards and, and claim your prize. But uh, good work, everyone. Thank you, Damien. Um, so Damien, you went to MIT, right? One of those places. One of those places, yeah. So you can tell he's, he's, he's the nerd of the group here. He loves data, absolutely loves it. So um, thank you guys for coming out. It's, it's fantastic to have everybody here. Um, everybody who's online, it's great to have you guys here as well uh, with us virtually. Uh, I just I have this image of, you know how when they tell you you're public speaking, you should picture everybody in your underwear? I'm pretty sure there's probably five to 10 people who are literally in their underwear right now watching this. So keep that image in your head as, as you go through breakfast here this morning. Um, wonderful. And, and so you know, as we, as we kick off here, um, I, I think it's really important to recognize the importance of what we're talking about. Um, I uh, have been with LinkedIn for about two and a half years. And prior to my time with LinkedIn, I actually worked at a, uh, at a staffing firm in Chicago. Um, I'm located out of our Chicago office as well. So um, 
what I've seen over the last two and a half years, the development and the shift in recruiting from um, really more of a, an administrative function to really developing into a strategic partner for businesses and more of a sales and marketing function. Um, it's been fantastic to be able to do these events and spend time with people like yourselves and actually learn about some of the challenges that you guys are facing today. Um, and hopefully come up with some good solutions uh, for you guys to run through. So as a, a quick overview of what we're going to walk through today, um, we're going to be looking at uh, what well, we got through the introduction, so that's good. We're going to look at the transformational power of the talent brand. So I was actually having a conversation with one of our panelists earlier, and I said, transformational power of anything is pretty daunting. It's kind of scary when you're, when you're thinking about it. You're like, man, we're going to transform. This, this is so powerful. It's going to be transformational for your business. And she actually said, well, it kind of is, you know, in a way. What it's done for our business, what it's done for me personally, and, and, and my standing and my ability to make asks of my teams. Um, so very excited to get into that stuff. Um, we're going to actually take a, a quick demonstration of uh, proactive recruitment on LinkedIn. So Nicole Seuss is going to come up and do that with us. And then um, the customer panel. So this is all of this stuff that we're doing before the customer panel is kind of that, OK, here, here are the, the concepts that we're embracing today. And here are the concepts that we want to provide you guys to be able to go back to the desk with. And the customer panel uh, hopefully will be that icing on the cake. And well, actually, that's probably the cake. We're probably the icing. Because that is really, really important to understand, OK, here's how other organizations have done this. Here's the success we can expect. And I would ask you guys, when they get up here, ask some really challenging questions. And I think you guys might be surprised by how easily they can actually answer those questions. We're talking data, we're talking ROI, all that kind of stuff. Um, from there, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap that up and get you guys back out into traffic. And those at home, you can get dressed and start your day. So I'm going to put some brands up here on the screen. And as we go through, uh, I want you guys to kind of think about your initial reaction to these brands. All very, very well-known brands in the marketplace. Some of the brands you guys probably identify with very strongly. I know my morning routine definitely involves Starbucks. Absolutely. I know my pie-in-the-sky dream is to buy a BMW someday. On the flip side, I'm about 5'6". For those of you at home who thought I was like 6'4", I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think I can drive a Harley. I just don't think I can do it. I, you know, it's, it's just it's not me. You know, So when we look at these brands, we have those reactions, some positive, some negative. There's a reason for that. Those positive reactions are probably because we're in the target market for these organizations. Those negative reactions are probably more so because we're not in that target market. And so when we have those negative re reactions, that's OK. And that's what these brands actually understand. These are all super premium brands in the marketplace. They all demand an extremely high price for their products. But because of how they're targeted and the resonation that they have with their target market, they're able to change the conversation and elevate themselves above price and above being a premium product into what it means to be a part of their brand. So as we look at their advertising, their advertising isn't about, hey, we got this great new engine in the BMW 5 Series. You guys should check it out. It's about, it's something worth waiting for. You've made it. Now, here you are. Starbucks coffee, the best coffee for you. The iPod, the iPad, anything from Apple. I mean, they have done an amazing job of having a targeted market that they go after. And there's people who just don't identify with these groups. But what this does, and, and the ability to target and be very accurate in who they identify with, it allows them to up-level their conversation to, this is what it means to be part of our brand. And what it's all about at the end of the day, it's about identity. It's about how do these brands create an identity for their users? What is the identity of their, these users when they're embracing these brands? It's about how it makes you feel to use these brands. And it's about an emotional attachment that you may have. So, the question that we're trying to answer today, and hopefully we do a nice job of it, is what would it mean if you, as a talent acquisition professional, as a company, had this ability 
So what would it mean to you when you're reaching out to individuals or when they experience your brand and you're looking to hire individuals, what would it mean if they had that same feeling for your company and for working for your company that they do for the brands that they use on a consumer basis? What would it do to your time to fill? What would it do to your cost per hire? What would it do to the quality of individual that you're able to get through the door? And then taking it to a personal level, what would it mean for you? So that's what we're going to try to actually answer today. We're going to try to give you guys some good stuff that you can go forward with. Uh, we don't want this to be a conversation about, OK, here's this pie in the sky idea. We want to be able to bring this down and say, here are some very actionable ways to develop, deploy, and really get your talent brand out there into the marketplace. So you guys may kind of pause me here as we look at these consumer brands and as you think about those companies that we showed, these are companies that have multi-million, probably billion dollar marketing budgets. You may say, hold on a second. We're a small company. I have to just absolutely fight tooth and nail for any dollar that I get. So this probably doesn't apply to us. Well, here's the great thing about Talent Brand. The beauty of Talent Brand is that you don't have to have everybody clamoring over themselves to come and work for you. Only the right people. So part of the game is, how do we find the right people? How do we figure out the right messaging to put in front of them? And how do we get it out there and embrace it on an ongoing basis? So we're going to have three big takeaways from the conversation today. And if we don't, uh, absolutely, if we don't achieve these three things, there's a bunch of folks with uh, orange lanyards in the back of the room, and we have a, a chat stream going for the streaming stuff. Call us out on it. Uh, we, we'd love to talk to you. Notice I'm not wearing the orange lanyard, so I'm going to run out of here as soon as possible so I don't get, uh, don't get yelled at by anybody. But no, we do want to hear. We want to find out. Um, we want to make sure that we are actually hitting these takeaways. And that is, uh, one, employer brand is vital to your recruiting outcomes. Number two, every company across the board, and we're going to hear from some companies that are in a different, different industries, different sizes, different target audience. Every company, regardless of industry, location, size, can harness employer and talent brand. And then last but not least, and this is the, the key, key part here, social media is really, really lovely in the playing field like never before. You don't need those multi-million dollar budgets. You don't need to have a department that's dedicated specifically to social media or to you know, employer brand. Very, very, very effective ways to articulate your brand through social media at a low cost and with minimal effort. So let's pause for a minute, take a breath. That's the big overarching pie in the sky, what we're looking to do here today. I would imagine I'm going to ask people in the room, how many of you have gone to a CEO or a VP of HR and said, I need X amount of dollars for something? And they were just like, hey, here you go. <laughs> anybody? If anybody at home can't hear, everybody's laughing in the room right now. So let's talk about the business case behind this whole thing, behind Talent Brand, and the effect that it has on a business. And when we actually get to the customer panel, there's some really interesting uh, data that, that they were able to share with me regarding um, what this has done to their business over the last couple of years. So definitely want to make sure that we key in on that when we have our customers panel up here. So the business case. Well, first and foremost, the ROI story. Strong talent brand versus weak talent brand. 50% savings in cost per hire for a company that has a strong talent brand versus a company that has a weak talent brand. So it's less expensive to get people in the door. Okay, so that's a great start. But what about those people that are joining your company? What about the long term? Companies with a stronger employer brand have a 28% lower turnover rate than companies with weaker employer brands. So it's not just about how do we get people in. It's about how do we keep the best people? How do we keep those folks at our organization cranking away? What we've seen is that talent leaders know that talent brand is important. So if we look at the stats on the screen here, 83% of the people that we have actually surveyed 
have said that employer brand has a significant impact on their ability to hire great talent. 83%. And it makes sense. You want to know what you're getting into. You want to know where you're going. A players aren't going to go somewhere just for, OK, well, I'm going to get a couple more dollars. They're going somewhere because they embrace and understand where they're going. It could be a mission-driven organization. Maybe that's what they're looking for. Maybe they want better work-life balance, or they want to have the opportunity to work on cool projects that they haven't had an opportunity to work on before. I don't know. It depends on what your market is. It depends on who you want to have a conversation with. What we're seeing, as people are slashing budgets left and right and trying to do more with less, uh, you know, doing, doing we need to do this much, but I'm only going to give you this much to do this much. 91% of companies spent more or the same on employer brand in 2012 versus 2011. And any, within these surveys, you know, any time you ask about you know, obstacles to attracting talent, concerns that competitors will do, top lasting trends in the marketplace, employer brand comes up constantly in the top responses. It is a, a, a top of mind topic that we want to make sure that as we go forward today, we're able to go ahead and, and develop nicely. So um, one thing I want to make sure that we do before we really dive in here, um, there has been a, a, a bit of a change in, in rhetoric. And I think it's important that we spend some time on it. So traditionally, employer brand, and that's something, it's a concept, it's a word that's been around for quite some time. Employer brand is basically, what do you put out in the marketplace for people to consume? It really harkens back to old school, like broadcast media, where you can say, this is who we are, accept it or don't. With social media, what we've seen is a development into what we call talent brand. So talent brand is a conversation. There are multiple sources that are inputting into your talent brand. You don't necessarily own the conversation anymore. But you have the ability to contribute. So think about this conceptually. Uh, you have a Facebook page, a LinkedIn page, a Twitter account, a YouTube account. Great. You have comments on all of those. You have current employees, past employees, potential employees, people who have accepted offers from you, people who have turned down offers from you. All of those people have access to tell their story. All of those people are part of your talent brand. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time actually talking about this and how to go to market with a talent brand in a couple of different ways, a couple of different avenues that hopefully will be helpful when you guys get to thinking about deploying a new strategy here. So for the, the remainder of my time here, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the power of brands. So we're going to take a step back. We're going to take a look at borrowing some stuff from consumer marketing and how do we pull that into talent branding. <laughs> wow. Evidently, LinkedIn doesn't want to associate themselves with me anymore. <laughs> this, is, this has just turned into, a, uh, turned into a Jake Ruby session, not a LinkedIn session. So. Um, to how marketers think about branding. So borrowing some of those concepts, borrowing some of those ideas from marketing. Uh, the great news is this has been done before, and we can actually just borrow some of that stuff from consumer marketing and branding and bring it into talent. Um, three, your talent brand. Um, we're going to we're going to spend some time. I'm going to take a break just so everybody's warned about this. I'm going to take a slight break in the middle of this, and I'm going to ask you guys after we go through some of these concepts to write down your talent brand, and then I'm going to ask a couple of you guys to share, and there may be some some swag in it for you. So. Just be ready for it. Start thinking about it. Every organization, um, where this fits into uh, some of the organizations that are a little bit far flung, uh, might be a little bit, you wouldn't necessarily think of them focusing on this, showing you some examples of how they do so, uh, how to go to market, and then how to measure it, how to actually have results and be able to bring those forward so that when you have a conversation internally to say, is this working or not? so we can understand what those key, uh, KPIs are that we're going to be looking at when you think about talent brand. Sound good? Everybody ready to rock? Everybody get enough coffee? No. Okay. All right. Fair enough. 
So let's, uh, let's take a step back. We're going to take a step way back. Oof. OK. So the history of brands in about 30 seconds. Brands developed initially as an identifier. I have a bunch of cattle. You have a bunch of cattle. I can't tell our cattle apart. What do you do? Slap a brand on it. I know this is my cattle. I know this is your cattle. As it developed, it turned into an identifier for products. So if you go back to the, back to the olden days before all of us here, how do you know that you're getting ivory soap when you go to the store if it's not packaged, if it doesn't have an identifier on it? From there, um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen Heinz tomato chutney out there in the marketplace. Evidently, ketchup did a little bit better than chutney did. Um, <laughs> but it's a way to be able to identify and actually bring those two things together. And then as we look at the consumer packaging industry, it, it really became kind of a, a promise of quality. So let's take a look at really what brand is. It's an identity, or I would say even an identifier, identity identifier, quality promise. When you buy, buy this product, as we have specified, this is what the product is. This is what you're going to get. And it's a decision-making shortcut. That's my favorite one, the decision-making shortcut. We would put it to you guys, talent brand is the same. It's how, who are you? What does this say about you? It's a quality product, promise. This is what you're going to get when you come here, right? This is what you can expect. This is what we're going to uphold. This is what we're telling you is going to happen, and this is what's going to happen, because our employees can also tell you that this is how it, it, it runs. And then the decision-making shortcut. And that's relevant here today. So let's think about that for a minute. Let's pause. A decision-making shortcut. Think about that in a talent perspective. You reach out to somebody proactively, and they immediately respond to you. Because they know who you are. They know what you offer. They understand your brand in the marketplace. What would that actually do to your business? What would that do for time to fill? What would that do on your cost per hire? To be able to quickly be able to engage individuals and have them make that decision very quickly, or at least get them the information that they need to make an informed decision. Brand is also a powerful motivator. So this is actually uh, one of my favorite case studies to look at when we talk about brand. I don't know how many people, I'm not going to have you raise your hand because it's going gonna, it's gonna to age you, but I don't know how many people in the room remember the Pepsi challenge going way back when. The Pepsi challenge. So the idea behind the Pepsi challenge, for those of us who don't know, Pepsi went from city to city to city doing a blind, face-to-face, heads-up taste test with Coke. City after city after city after city. Objectively, people picked Pepsi over Coke when it came to taste. So we all know how the story went. Pepsi through the roof, Coke. I don't think you can find a Coke anymore, right? So sure, what actually ended up happening, Pepsi ended up gaining some market share. Did pretty well. Coke is the red line on this, by the way. What happened was Coke is such a strong brand that Pepsi gained a little bit of ground for some time, and they evened the score a little bit. But what they did is they took market share from the other soda companies. They didn't take market share from Coca-Cola, even though, objectively speaking, Pepsi tasted better than Coke for the vast majority of the population. So when we talk about brand being a powerful motivator, that's a pretty powerful motivator, right? And I know personally, and gosh, I hope she's not on the stream right now watching this, if I go to the store and I buy Pepsi or Diet Pepsi and I come home, my girlfriend will kill me. I will be back at the store buying Diet Coke. That's how it goes. And I don't understand. I like Pepsi better than Coke, personally. So I don't get it. But I do like to have a happy home life. So let's take a look at another study. Harley Davidson. 
so Harley Davidson, as we looked at a little bit earlier, um, Harley Davidson actually had a, a bit of a problem, uh, especially in the northern climates like Chicago, where I come from. So Harley had an issue where uh, you have a rough winter or a long winter in, in Chicago, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Indiana, in Minnesota, and you get to ride your Harley three, four, five months out of the year. That's a big problem. So if you identify yourself with Harley, and that's who you are, you're a Harley guy, what do you do? Or a, a Harley girl, for that matter. What do you do? Well, uh, they came out with the Harley Davidson truck. You brand yourself. You brand your kids. How about it? I mean, that's, that's power right there. I mean, that's incredible. It's, it's how do you identify yourself when you aren't out on your Harley, on the actual product itself? You buy swag and you get tattoos. Anybody have a Harley tat in the room? <laughs> and really what it all comes down to, if you guys think about it, is everybody wants to be a part of something, right? Everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. This is why people say people in the Bay Area are crazy, by the way, <laughs> just so you guys know. And I'm a little bit bitter because I'm a Tigers fan, and your Giants just worked us over last year in the World Series. So I know I didn't need that. Thank you very much. I know the A's beat the Tigers yesterday handily and swept the series, OK? God. You know what? You guys can figure out your own talent brand issues, OK? I'm done here. But think about it. People want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. People pay, pay, they paint their faces. Well, we were down in Dallas for an event, and uh, I was able to find a picture of a guy who literally had all of the Dallas Cowboys championship trophies tattooed on his back. <laughs> Not only does he have it tattooed on his back, but he goes shirtless to every game. And he was not a slim dude. <laughs> not at all. So let's think about this, though. Let's bring that in and bring it home. Okay. Everybody wants to be a part of something. They want to broadcast their part of something. They want to feel that they're part of something bigger than them. What would it mean if you could get this going for your organization? So what we're going to challenge you guys to do is think about what does it mean to work for your company, for your organization? What does it mean internally? What does it mean externally? What does it mean in the marketplace? Because if you think about it, you know, you go football, you got 16 games a year if you're the Detroit Lions and you never make the playoffs. If you're the 49ers, you know, you get a couple extra games in and then lose in the Super Bowl. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but where do you spend most of your time? Here, at work, right? So when we're talking about this, we're not talking about perks, just to clarify. Okay, we're not talking about we've got an on-site gym. We're not talking about compensation. We're not talking about benefits, necessarily. We're talking about what does it actually mean to work for your company. Because I can tell you, the A players at your company, they can go down the street and probably make more money somewhere else, or at least a comparable salary. I mean, we talk about talent. We're in the Bay Area. Anybody recruit for tech talent around here? How much fun is that? Now the key here, <laughs> glad we got a you who out there. The key here is understanding that the things that matter to these guys on screen right now are different than what matters to these guys and what matters to these guys, right? So that's the key, understanding there are going to be different motivators for different people. Now that's not to say that you can just flip flop all over the place and be different for everybody that you talk to. But figuring out what the core mission or the core ideal or the core interesting piece of who you guys are and what you do and how it resonates with your marketplace, that's the key. So this is actually a kind of a good pausing place for me here. Uh, and, and this is on the screen as a reminder. Um, what we're going to do after this session, uh, everybody who's here and everybody who's streaming live, uh, we're going to go ahead and send you guys out the talent brand playbook. Uh, some of you guys have them on your
table right now. Um, one of the, the, my favorite parts of the Talent Brand Playbook is this survey, sample survey question section. Um, what I've found, and I've, I've worked with companies really across the board over the last two and a half, three years, what I've found is there's a lot of organizations out there who have never sat down with their A players and ask them very frank questions about what they like, what they don't like about their company, about why they work here. You know, we have these, you know, we have these, these big surveys out there that we'll send out to an entire organization and we get like 30% response to them. And we expect that to be able to inform our decisions. Well, what if we, what if we carved off just those top performers from the different departments and say, sit down with them for a lunch or for a half hour and ask some of these sample survey questions. Where do you think our place is in the marketplace? Why'd you come here? But it's not only that, why don't we talk to people that we're interviewing and pepper some of these questions in there? You know, what would keep you from taking a job at our organization? What have you learned about us in the research that you're doing before you came to this interview here? Those people who didn't accept an offer, are we engaging those folks? Are we asking them if they'd be willing to have a conversation with us about why they didn't take an offer from us? It's a great opportunity to get an idea of where you sit in the marketplace today. So I would definitely recommend as you guys take a look at that talent brand playbook, if you can utilize the, uh, the sample survey. I love this thing. Um, I'm kind of a geek as well when it comes to data, so this is fun to have. So let's talk about the attributes of a consumer brand. So going forward, um, what we're going to do from here on is we're going to talk through here are the, the different pieces that we need to make sure that we're filling into our brand when we go to market with it. So we're going to talk a little bit about consumer brand and then we're going to transfer it over to talent brand and how we apply those things. So the attributes of a consumer brand, relevant, got to be relevant to your target audience, right? Consistent, got to build trust. As I said, you can't be all over the board with your brand. You can't change for everybody that you talk to in some, some substantial way. It's got to be credible. You actually have to deliver on your promises. If you're telling people, hey, our work-life balance is great, or hey, we're a very community-minded community organization, and then they start with you and they see that that's not the case at all, your turnover, probably going to be up there at that point. Inspirational connects, resonates with your target audience. What is it that they care about? What is it that's going to compel them to take action here? And this is, this is going to be a lot of fun as we talk to our, our panelists about um, how they inspire action. Uh, I, I mean, I, I can't wait for these guys to come up. It's going to be a great time. Unique. Got to be different. That's one of the challenges, I think, in the Valley. You know. We've got awesome food, we've got free lunch, we've got a gym, we've got flexible working hours. There's a, a small company across the street from us that probably does about the same thing. And they've got funny multicolored bikes too. <laughs> so when we think about that consumer brand, a talent brand, it really it's the same principles. We can borrow those principles as we develop our talent brand, right? It's got to be relevant. It's got to be something that compels people to move from where they're working today, take action, and go into the unknown. Think about that. When you think about the people that you're hiring that are currently working in, an, in, an, in a job, they've got to leave somewhere that they're presumably pretty comfortable and go into the unknown. So all of these things help to make that an easier decision for those individuals. That's not to say that everybody in your organization is going to feel the same way about everything. And so the next piece that we're going to borrow from consumer marketing is something called segmentation. Essentially what segmentation is, is we have an overarching brand. BMW, the ultimate driving machine. I think they're still using that. Within that, you have the 1 series, the 3 series, the 5 series, and the 7 series. Each of these individual series are targeted towards a specific segment of the marketplace. The one series, 20s professionals. The three series, 30s professionals, if you're lucky. The, four series, or the five series, 40s professionals. 
and the seven series, those executives, those guys who guys and women who have made it, you know. So they're all the ultimate driving machine. They're just the ultimate driving machine at different levels of your life, of your career. And that's the segue. Talent segmentation. When you think about this, and I'm sure you've probably seen it, you can't have the same conversation with a junior engineer and a senior engineer and a salesperson and executive. It's a different conversation. So that's where it becomes so important to understand those segments that you're hiring for, understand what compels those different individuals, and figure out how you can keep that overarching talent brand but segment to make sure that you're, you're keying in on each of those individual areas, right? And so, you know, thinking about things like what's the education level, what's the experience, motivation, values, work style, career ambition, you know, I step into a role and I want to see the opportunity for growth. You bring in an, a senior executive and it's possible that they're looking to maybe write a ship that's not doing so well right now. Maybe that's what they're into. So there are differences in how you address those individuals and those different segments underneath that overarching brand. So one of the questions that we ask you guys to ask yourselves and your organizations and your hiring managers is who are the heroes in each of those different groups? So after you segment, figure out, okay, who are the heroes in sales? Who are the heroes in technology engineering? Who are the heroes in recruiting? Who are the heroes in marketing? And what do we celebrate about those individuals? And so I'm going to share a, a, a personal story with you guys um, about the difference between the heroes at one organization that I've worked for and another organization that I've worked for. I feel like this should be a picture of Miley Cyrus right now. <laughs> no, no. Um, so. The LaSalle Network, the staffing firm that I worked for in Chicago, great company. Great company. If anybody does business in Chicago, let me know. I'll get you in contact with them. These guys are local to Chicago. They do staffing and recruiting, both temporary and perm placement, for accounting and finance, office services admin, uh, technology, and um, they do a lot of like customer service stuff as well. So the staffing and recruiting world, anybody who's come from that world, the agency world. Cool. Five years at Robert Half. There you go. <laughs> Five years at Robert Half. Fairly relationship driven business, right? You know, it's, it's very, very relationship driven. It's finding those hiring managers that have pain and making sure that you have that good relationship so you're the first call so you get the jump so you can fill those roles. And so the heroes at the LaSalle Network are the sales team who are out there in the marketplace doing dinners. And we would do these weekly stand-ups where the sales team would present essentially what their week looked like. And you would often hear, Monday I went and had drinks with client X, Y, and Z. Tuesday I had dinner with these guys. Wednesday we had a box at the Allstate Arena in Chicago. Wednesday, I, I've seen Britney Spears three or four times. I've seen Michael Buble. I don't want to tell you how many times. <laughs> I, I love Michael Buble. I think this is, this is my, my announcement, my coming out party, that Michael Buble is awesome. <laughs> But the heroes are those people that are maniacally focused on getting out there, spending time, building the relationships, going out to dinners three nights a week, going out to the box to go to concerts or monster truck rallies. Do you guys have any idea how loud monster truck rallies are? I got out of the car. I was like three miles away, parked from the arena, and you can hear it. I'm sitting there going, I'm going to go inside there? You've got to be kidding me. They make a killing on earplugs at that place. It's fantastic. So the heroes are those people who are very, very focused on how do we build the best relationship that we can with our clients. Because if we don't, they're going to call somebody else first. Flash forward to today, the difference between the LaSalle network and LinkedIn. Our heroes at LinkedIn are not me. They're not the sales folks. The heroes at LinkedIn are the people who are putting out new, innovative, exciting products on a day-to-day -day basis. They make our jobs incredibly easy. So when you think about that, OK, so what resonates with those heroes, with those people who are coming out with new stuff, interesting things? What do they need from us to be successful? And when we're going out into the marketplace and talking to those types of individuals, 
what is it that they care about? So as part of the survey, as part of the, the conversation that you guys have internally, I would absolutely recommend figuring out who are the heroes, what qualifies them to be in that space, and how do we go out and find more of those people? What resonates with those individuals? And again, the heroes at one organization are going to be different than the heroes at another organization and another organization. But here's the key. The most engaged employees have a sense of pride behind where they work. Whatever the reason is, and it's, there's not one set dynamic, this is, a, you know, this is exactly what it is that you have to go to market with. It can be any number of things, but what does it feel like when you're out there at a dinner, at a cocktail party, at a, a ball game, and you're talking to somebody, and they say, where do you work? What feeling do you guys get when you tell? And that's what it's all about. It's the sense of pride. It's caring deeply about the future of their organization. And it's really being inspired by their company to do the best work that they possibly can for their company. So let's take a look at how some companies get this. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on Sungevity because we have somebody from Sungevity here who can speak more clearly to their talent brand. So this is actually really fun and unique. And she can correct anything that I say that's not exactly accurate here. Um, so how do we get that sense of pride? How do we get that type of engagement, that inspiration? A lot of different ways to do it. Sungevity does it in a very mission-driven way. Uh, Sungevity does solar panels for homes, correct, essentially? So solar panels, who do they want to target? Who do they want to go after? Sungevity is looking for people who are on a clean energy crusade who are looking to save the world by addressing the environmental issues of our time. It's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. So everything that Sungevity does is focused on that market segment that that message is going to resonate with, those mission-driven individuals. And it's not just in the literature that they put out. It's in their job opportunities. And I use the word opportunities very specifically here. Because if you guys are just posting jobs right now, you're not doing your job. It's opportunities. It's where, where, how is this going to resonate with me? Where do I go next? So what Sungevity does is they bring that into everything that they put out there so that that target market and that target segment understands that mission-driven sort of focus that they have. So another company, um, Marine Harvest, more lifestyle-driven. Uh, and I'm going to ask the people in the room, anybody in the room remember the uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? back in like elementary school? Doctors, lawyers, talent acquisition professionals, <laughs> baseball players, basketball players, football players. Did anybody say, I want to be in seafood processing? <laughs> Raise your hands. Anybody from home? Cool. Well, that's what Marine Harvest does, seafood processing. So let's think about that talent brand challenge for a second. If you're going to market saying, you are gutting fish. That is your job. Well, not really. I mean, you're working for a company that processes seafood. How, does, how do you think that's going to resonate? So what Marine Harvest does is says, you know, that's kind of secondary. We're in, uh, offering stable year-round employment located in some of the most beautiful places in the world. Vancouver Island. Outdoorsy folks. Anybody in the room? Head north. Vancouver Island. So they're highlighting the lifestyle that they can provide for their employees. So it's not about here's what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day -to -day basis. It's here's the opportunity that you have when you come and work with our organization. You're going to be in one of the most beautiful places in the world where this is your back door. That's going to resonate with some people. It's also going to not resonate with, with others. You have your city folks who are going to go stir crazy out there you know, with so much to do, but nobody around to do it with. Those people who live in New York or Chicago or San Francisco, 
they may not be into this type of lifestyle. And that's okay. Because Marine Harvest is looking for the people who are. They're also looking for people who care about sustainability, who care about giving back to the community. And if you look at this list of, of organizations that Marine Harvest supports, it basically goes to the floor. So they've identified, we've got a market, we have a target market that is lifestyle driven, that cares about these things, that's what we do. This is actually what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and our talent brand, we want it to be a lifestyle driven talent brand. So this is the point where we pause. And I'm asking everybody to take exactly one minute, I've got a clock up here, to write down what is your talent brand. And everybody at home can do it too. And we actually have the chat, I think, live. So if anybody wants to chat in some ideas, it's a, you're, you're welcome to do that as well. So one minute starting now. Five seconds. All right, pencils down. Or keep writing, that's okay. We're not going to tell you what to do. Anybody want to share? All right, we've got one. <laughs> I'm sure we could probably scare some swag up for you. So, just in the process of making one, but we're Stable. Thank you. We're actually a, a startup, kind of a restartup mode, so you get a chance to build, you get a chance to innovate, and you work in one of the most beautiful places in the world, right in Union Square in downtown San Francisco. Looking out on Union Square, and it's just fabulous, and we have fun, and we have food, and we have beer in the fridge. Okay. That's it. <laughs> All right. So, uh... <laughs> Somebody, somebody is, uh, somebody's hoping that, that there's a, uh, a CEO somewhere watching this right now. <laughs> Maybe in Union Square, one of the most beautiful places in the world. So when we think about this, that's, that's awesome. All of those attributes make sense. Great to pull that together. Um, let's think about how we could kind of bring that out, you know, and, and make it into something that's a little bit more digestible when we put it out there and when we're talking to people. You know, we're, we're you know, in a restart mode company working in Union Square, San Francisco. You get to be in the thick of it all. What a great opportunity, you know. Um, you get to affect change with an organization that's restarting what they're doing, and you get to live in San Francisco. You can't afford to live in San Francisco, but you get to live in San Francisco. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? All right, uh, we do have a mic right over there, so that might actually go live. Testing. You're good. So we're also in, in Union Square as well. Um, and uh, central location is often cited as one of the best uh, reasons why people work at our company. Sure. So um, uh, some of the um, attributes that come to mind for our company is entrepreneurial, uh, being able to make an impact, so a fast, uh, a, a fast career trajectory, uh, global, cosmopolitan, uh, well-traveled, fun-loving, and hip. All right, all right. This almost we're, sounds. We're, we're getting this, there. This is this is turning into a <laughs> this is turning into a dating site really quick here. Hot. <laughs> we also like long walks on the beach. <laughs> no, that's great. As you th as you guys think about that stuff, pulling that into that nice like concise. How do you make that unique? Would be my question. So what what makes that particularly unique in this area? And you know, what is it that, that you guys would be able to differentiate yourselves from the rest of the market on? And, and I think that's, that's a great starting point for 
those conversations that you guys are having. Um, I don't think we had any chats in. Anybody else want to share real quick? We got one more. All right, cool. Hop up. All right. So I work for the Sierra Club, not the chapter that you may have worked with before. I work for the national organization. Cool. Uh, so as the oldest and largest environmental organization in the, in the U.S., the Sierra Club is a place where people from many backgrounds with a passion for the environment use their skills to protect, enjoy, and explore the planet. Oh. I'm sold. I'm working for the Sierra Club. My mother would be very proud. All right, so thank you guys for sharing. That's great. And, and uh, I, I'm sure Damien's back there tracking everybody who shared. Come and see us afterwards, and we'll, uh, we'll figure something out for you guys. I know it's uh, when we're streaming and everybody's in the room. It's wonderful for sharing. So that's great. As we start to think about that, how do we, how do we develop that, that talent brand? How do we you know, figure out the right pieces that we pull in there? How do we figure out a nice, concise way to put it out there? Now, the real question is, how do we go to market? And what I want to make sure that we understand is this is not like one of those situations where you pull a bunch of stuff together and then you have a big red deploy button and you hit deploy and all of a sudden your talent brand is out there and it's working. And I would, uh, I would definitely encourage you guys as we go through and have the customer panel up, ask them questions about how they've developed their talent brand over time because that's really important to understand. The great thing about this, and the great thing about social media in particular when you think about your talent brand, is that it allows you to be very nimble. It allows you to be very dynamic in the different avenues that you go down, the different ways that you present. It allows you to try things, and it allows you to do that at a very minimal cost. What it doesn't allow you to do is to go out there throw it out there, let it sit there, and never do anything with it. So making a Facebook page, making a, a LinkedIn page, creating a Twitter account, creating a YouTube account, doesn't do anything for you if you don't use it. It's like a gym membership. I have a gym membership. I don't use it. <laughs> so let's start with how you project your talent brand into the talent marketplace. Okay. Number one, first and foremost, key thing. Some of you guys probably have 50 people working for you. Some of you probably have 10,000. Living it every day with your employees. Think about that. If you've got 50, if you've got 100, if you've got 5,000, if you've got 10,000 employees that work for your organization, all of those people have a voice in your talent brand. And for a lot of you, I would assume there's either one or two or three or five of you in recruiting and talent acquisition. That's not a fair fight. So you've got to live it every day with your employees because they are going to be and can be your biggest advocates and your biggest attractors. Two, in your community. So this is actually a, a really, I love this picture because I, I was fortunate enough to be in Dublin um, while this was going on. In Dublin, they put on these dragon boat races in the harbor, uh, and they raise a bunch of money and, and to give to charity. And all of the local organizations and uh, a lot of the tech companies in Dublin will sponsor teams. And I was there, not on a team, thankfully, because it was about 45 degrees with about 30 mile an hour winds, and it was wet. So, but the, the idea behind it and the key here is what is your place in the community? The community where you're located, the community that your people are working in, what do they think about you? So think about the effect that that can have on your talent brand when you think about your community and you think about how many people may interact with your brand on a regular basis. And then social media. So again, using those sources of social media, if you're not going to use them, if you're not going to maintain and you're not going to work on these and you're not going to have this be a work in progress, I feel personally, and I'm going to probably ask our, our folks on the customer panel to, to answer this too, it's probably more detrimental to your brand to have a shell of something out there that you're not using. So if it's something that you want to do, do it. And then last but not least, and where we're going to spend time because we did feed you all breakfast, on LinkedIn. So how do we project our talent brand 
into the talent marketplace on LinkedIn. We're going to start talk about why LinkedIn is important, give you guys some data, some numbers, some stats. Uh, your company on LinkedIn, how to make your company shine on LinkedIn, how to use your employee base on LinkedIn to help to develop and broadcast your talent brand, and then looking at your career opportunities, not jobs, career opportunities on LinkedIn and how to make those shine as well. So let's dive in. Why LinkedIn is vital. Last check, 238 million members on the LinkedIn network. This is a very, very, very large network to be able to get your brand out to. That's not to say that you need to get all 238 million LinkedIn members into your company. That'd be rough. But taking that sample size and being able to target specifically the right people, they're out there. It's just how do you find them, how do you engage them, how do you bring them through the door? Growing at a rate of two new members per second, 100% of the Fortune 500 uh, are represented on LinkedIn, and 87% of the Fortune 100 are using LinkedIn's talent solutions in some way, shape, or form. So what are people doing on LinkedIn? And I'll tell you guys, job searching is not the number one activity on LinkedIn. About 80% of our network would be considered to be passive, and about 20% would be considered to be active in some way, shape, or form. And we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, so what are they doing? Well, LinkedIn has become the place to manage your identity, to connect with people who could potentially be good business partners, to keep in touch with former colleagues, to find that new opportunity, or have that new opportunity find you even when you're not looking. It's also a place to find some incredible insights. Um, and this has been a very big focus for LinkedIn over the last couple of years, is how do we provide more insights to our membership base? So LinkedIn's mission statement is connecting the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. When 80% of our network aren't looking for a job, we've got to find other ways to do that. And the way that we do that is through our insights. So. Think about um, LinkedIn Today. If you guys have used the LinkedIn Today module, essentially it's a news aggregator where you get to select the things that you're interested in and news is filtered to you based off of what your network is interacting and sharing. Um, the Influencers Program, uh, which was recently released, uh, there's a couple hundred business leaders that are blogging directly to LinkedIn. So you can actually follow those, in, uh, those influencers and have them come directly to your news stream. Things like the endorsements tool, where you can recommend very quickly the people in your network who are thought leaders in particular areas. And they can recommend you. And then last but not least, being everywhere uh, where our members work. And this is one of my favorites. So I travel a lot. Uh, I travel for client meetings. I travel for company events. And so for me, what oftentimes happens is I'll have somebody that I'm talking to as a sales professional, and they say, yeah, we'd love to have you down to our office. An hour before the meeting, they add five other people to the invite. Cool. Now I have no idea who I'm meeting with. With the LinkedIn iPad app, we actually have an integration with your Outlook calendar, where when those email addresses are added to that invite, we'll automatically add them to your iPad app. And you can click on their pictures and pull up their full profiles. For, so for those people who are on the run, great way to get insights and understand what's going on. The other key here, and our, um, our mobile page views are at about 30% of total page views on a monthly basis at this point. Increasingly, the workforce is not behind a desktop computer on a day-to-day -day basis. And so being able to get your brand and interact with individuals out on mobile is very, very important. And so that's where we want to engage that kind of everywhere theme. So we talked a little bit about passive versus active. 82% um, of LinkedIn members would be considered to be either passive or super passive. I'll be honest with you, I don't know what qualifies super passive. I guess maybe those people who have said, if you came to me with the pre president of the United States opportunity, I'd make a move. Um, and then about 18% would be considered to be active, either very active or semi-active. The great thing is, people on LinkedIn want to hear from you. 
and some of you guys in the room and some of you at home may have participated in this poll. Um, there was a poll that was actually run by one of our members who said, do you mind a recruiter reaching out to you on LinkedIn? About 95% of those respondents said, as long as the role is relevant, I don't mind hearing from recruiters. So extrapolate that out a little bit. You've got 20% active, 80% passive, this whole giant audience of individuals that you can get out to that you can't really find on other sources, and they want to hear from you. It's a pretty good opportunity. Now, they want to hear from you, but to engage them, it takes a little bit of a different approach. So the traditional active job seeker generally, and, and I want to make this clear here, I don't think that active or passive job seekers are better or worse than the other. I think there's a bigger audience of passive job seekers out there in the marketplace. And so we need to be engaging those individuals too. But an active job seeker is going to function differently than a passive job seeker. Active job seekers are going to come and seek more information. They're going to come to you and look at your job board. They're going to go traipsing across the internet to find information about your company before they make an application. They actually send an application. Um, they're just going to behave differently. Whereas a passive job seeker, traditionally, they want to find that information as easily as possible. If something sparks a passive job seeker's interest, there's a good chance that they could be at work. I know I personally don't want to be found on some other company's career site at work when I'm trying to do my job. So being able to give them relevant, interesting information in a very digestible fashion is incredibly important when you're dealing with passive talent. So let's talk about how we can do that on LinkedIn, um, starting off with your company. So some of the stuff that we're going to talk about is going to be uh, free stuff that you guys can go back and do today. Some of it is going to be premium talent solutions that uh, would have a price tag on it. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Turns out there's no such thing as a free breakfast either. So your company on LinkedIn. Everybody in this room has access to a free company page on LinkedIn. Within that company page, you can actually do quite a bit. You can add a banner. You can do company status updates so that when people are following your company, that is, they've raised their hand and said, I want to know about what this company is doing, they receive status updates from you in their newsfeed from the company. And one thing that actually a lot of people don't know, you can actually segment your company status updates to particular groups of individuals. So you could actually say, I want to send this status update specifically out to IT professionals, as opposed to this status update, which is meant to resonate with sales professionals. This is a free service. This does not cost anything but your time to set up, manage, and monitor. From there, um, so that was status updates. Products and services. Little, maybe little known, little used, not as much as it should be, solution on LinkedIn. Um, you can actually highlight your products and services on LinkedIn next to your company page for free. From there, your clients, your business partners, your customers can actually recommend those products and services. So when somebody who is looking to do business with you comes to this page, they can actually see recommendations from individuals who have used your services or your products before. In my opinion, my personal opinion, this is not speaking for the company, this is one of the most underutilized solutions that we offer for free on LinkedIn. This is a great opportunity to develop business. And it's a great opportunity to bring your marketing departments into a conversation, if you haven't already. Careers. So the careers page on LinkedIn. This is not free. This is a paid service uh, from our talent solutions. What the careers page on LinkedIn does is it provides context around your careers. So when we talk about the difference between passive and active job seekers, one of the key, key differences is that passive job seekers do not want to have to traipse all over the internet to find out information about your company, about what it's like to work at your company. 
So with the LinkedIn Careers page, what we do is we pull in all the jobs that you have posted on LinkedIn. We make those jobs dynamic based on the viewer of this page. So as a, a sales professional, I'm going to see the sales jobs that you guys have posted at the top of the list. We give you the opportunity to do videos, like employment videos. Um, we highlight how the viewer is connected to your company. And we also give you the opportunity to do employee testimonials that are live and active and linked to specific employees that are working for your company on LinkedIn. Which leads very nicely uh, to every employee as an ambassador. So your employees' profiles. Um, this is a great, great, great opportunity that I think a lot of organizations do miss as well, is engaging your employees to be brand ambassadors for your talent brand. This is a, a, a tricky thing to do because you're asking your employees to help you out and to represent what it's like to work at your company. Their LinkedIn profile is their own personal property. Um, so ways to get people moving in that direction is to lead by example. Number one, a picture. Gotta have, I have a picture on LinkedIn. If I have a picture on LinkedIn, there's no reason anybody else shouldn't have a picture on LinkedIn. I have my dog in my picture, though, so it makes it a lot cuter. <laughs> I don't recommend having your dog in your picture. Um, so having a picture, having a descriptive headline. Your headline doesn't have to be your title. It doesn't have to be you know, something specifically, I'm a talent acquisition leader. It can be what your mission is in your job, what you're looking to do. Finding the best people to help my company X, Y, and Z. Uh, linking to specific websites, having a strong summary, you know, making sure that you have that 100% built out profile and being kind of the, the, the model for your organization to follow. From there, roll it out. Engage your recruiting team, engage your hiring managers, and engage your executives. Make it easy for your employees to find a standard to work off of. Once your hiring managers, once your executives see the results here, it makes that conversation a lot easier about why LinkedIn is important, why social media is important, why we need to focus on our talent brand specifically. And then from there, your career opportunities on LinkedIn. So um, LinkedIn offers a variety of different options for opportunities. Um, essentially, the jobs network on LinkedIn uh, the way that it's differentiated is we have a ton of data on individuals and from companies. What we can do is match up your jobs to the most relevant individuals on LinkedIn, plant them on their homepage so that they're seeing opportunities that are actually going to be engaging to them. All of these things work together very nicely. Uh, you engage somebody on their homepage, they seek more information about your company, they come to your careers page on LinkedIn, and they can understand what it's like to work at your company very, very quickly, they can make that decision to take that next step. The other opportunity is to engage individuals and your employees on their personal profiles. One of the number one, I believe it's still the number one activity on LinkedIn is people viewing other people's profiles. It's a little bit creepy when you think about it, but think about how you spend your time on LinkedIn and then don't judge everybody else. <laughs> So um, when those individuals are engaging with your uh, employees on LinkedIn, we can actually allow you to own the ad space on their, their profiles. And you can actually highlight your career opportunities with ads. And we can make it social and dynamic so that here we have Addison who's looking at Jim's profile. We're pulling in Addison's picture into this ad unit as well as her experience. And we're making it relevant to her. So these, again, the keys to passive talent acquisition Relevance is really, really important. So we want to make sure that any time that we engage with individuals, it is a relevant experience. So from here, um, what we're going to do is we're going to actually bring up our customer panel. And I'm going to let uh, Nicole introduce everybody when she comes up. And Nicole Seuss, come on up. Um, and they're going to talk through, uh, actually, what they're doing, how things are working. We're going to get them started with a couple of questions, and then we're going to ask, or no, Nicole's going to do, uh, sorry, you guys, you guys are good for a minute. We're going we're gonna to do a slight recruiter demo first, and then we're going to move into the customer panel. So 
um, taking it to the next level here, proactive sourcing on LinkedIn. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. So my name is Nicole Seuss, and for the record, I am not visualizing anyone in their underwear. So you're welcome. <laughs> Um, I am an account executive here at LinkedIn on the small to medium sized business segment. I have a couple of years experience from, from another large employment website and before that was also in the headhunting space for several, several years. So I know how, it is, how hard it is to find those uh, Silicon Valley engineers as well. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you guys about Recruiter because I'm a strong believer that this is one of the most beneficial and powerful tools that is out in the recruitment work, um, the recruitment space today. Essentially what it is, it is the keys to the city. You get full unrestricted access to go contact all 238 million members. Not just contact them, but find, sort, and figure out exactly who you want to do that very quickly, at scale, efficiently, manage your efforts, and then measure your efforts through data and analytics. So who here has seen LinkedIn Recruiter? Anyone? OK, quite a few. So for some of you, this will be a refresher, as well as some product updates. And for the rest of you, this should be pretty informative. So let's actually take a look. We can easily, easily spend an hour on Recruiter, but I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, we will run a quick search. I'll show you how to contact folks. We can look at some data and analytics. And we can talk about pipelining, so proactive recruitment. So we're in the Silicon Valley, so we'll do engineers. Who here is familiar with Boolean searches? OK, a couple of you. You can definitely use Boolean searches here if you'd like. And let's make something specific, a Java engineer or developer. With LinkedIn Recruiter, you have a lot more searching and sorting capabilities. Now, there are a couple of specific points I want to touch on before we hop into it. This particular platform is actually designed for recruitment. Your normal LinkedIn profile is designed for networking, so they have a very different feel to them. Um, there's also a data integrity piece. Anybody here invested in a recruiter just to lose, lose them to their competition? Has that ever happened? It hurts, it hurts when it does. Um, so this tool is actually retained by the company and can be transferred. So all of the pipelining activities you do within it are actually owned by the organization and the data integrity stays there. So. We look at this and there are tons more search criteria that allow you to be very specific in picking out who exactly you want. Personally, when I do this, I start wide and then I start narrowing people down as I go. So 1.2 million engineers or developers with the word Java on their profile. Obviously, a few more than we want to look at today. So we'll keep it narrowed down to the San Francisco Bay Area. And you can see almost 66,000 folks that you can find very quickly. Let's say you want to come after us. You want to look at the LinkedIn engineers. We have a strong employment brand. Good luck. <laughs> no. Um, so here's really quickly 708 engineers or developers who have the word Java work in the Silicon Valley for LinkedIn. Took me maybe a second to find them very quickly and efficiently. The next tool is the ability to reach out and contact folks. You can look at people's individual profiles. So we'll look at this individual. No matter how I am connected to them, I can see full access. With your individual profiles, you can see your first degree connections, you can see some of your second, and a little bit of your third. Beyond that, you don't have any visibility. Again, this is full unrestricted access. I can tag these people. Maybe they're an active candidate. I can add my own status, like this person is horrible, don't ever call them again. Or I can request that the system update me if they start 
updating their own profiles in a way that indicates they may be looking for a job in the near future. So there are a lot of tools here you can do individually. You can also send messages directly right here. One of the powerful pieces of this is the one-to-many messaging. So let's assume I looked at all 25 of these people on the first page and I like them all. I can go ahead and hit send a message after I've selected who I want to contact. I've got a template in here and I'm done. I've now sent out 25 what we call in-mails to people. They all receive them in an individual fashion. So, you know, hi Brian, hi Jonathan, so on and so forth. It's not a BCC type scenario. These people can respond individually and they won't know they're sort of getting master blasted. Essentially, this is a very quick, easy, and efficient way to, for you to go out and reach proactive candidates, passive candidates. So instead of the post and pray methodology of putting up a job and waiting for people to come to you, this is a very um, strategic way for you to go out and reach out to the people that you actually want to talk to who are not necessarily looking for a job. It's very powerful. Each of these in-mails, um, you, you get a limited amount with LinkedIn Recruiter. So each one, you have a seven-day response guarantee. So a message is never wasted. If nobody responds, you get that credit back. So that's finding people and reaching them. The next piece is the ability to pipeline candidates. One of the things that we look at when we're working with companies to help them develop a strong talent acquisition strategy is how reactive or proactive are you? Um, it, sometimes it's hard not to be reactive. Positions come up and, and we understand that. But the best companies can be proactive in positions that they regularly hire for. So in that case, we have what we call talent pipeline. I've created a sample project here, but let's say your sample project is named software engineer with Java experience in the Silicon Valley. You can store profiles in here. You can mark tags on them. You can share these profiles with hiring managers in a nice little package where the hiring managers can actually write feedback on the profiles and send them directly back to you. You can manage all of this here. Let's say you talk to this person and they've got some stock options vesting and they're not ready to leave until after that's done. Great. Mark them as a future prospect and set yourself a reminder to call them in three months. It can all be done within the tool. Again, still the ability to add tags so you can easily search for specific people. It can all be done within Recruiter. The other great thing is we're not going to limit you to people that you just find on our platform. You can upload resumes. You can manually type in contact information for individuals. Um, you go to a career fair and you find a whole bunch of people. You can upload an Excel spreadsheet full of folks in here. If they have a LinkedIn profile, it will automatically sync. If they don't, it will create a contact piece for you to manage them within LinkedIn Recruiter. So this is not necessarily a replacement for an applicant tracking system although it can be if you don't have one. Um, this is the, the space you're in before you actually get the resume, while you're still courting these passive candidates to come over to your, to your organization. So it's, um, the goal here is to get companies to leave the paper resume, to leave the Excel spreadsheets, and to be more thoughtful around this. The last piece that I wanted to show you today was some of the analytics. Again, we're a big data company. If we can't measure it, then it's not useful. So we want to give you all the reporting capabilities that you can. The pipeline, for example. You can see that in this case, the vast majority of the candidates that I source come from LinkedIn directly. Some of them come from our applicant tracking system, referrals, networking, and so on and so forth. So I can see exactly what resources are working best for me in each specific um, skill set that I have. There's also reporting and analytics on job postings. You can see how many clicks you're getting, how many views you're getting, what type of people are actually looking at your job. Maybe it's written poorly and you don't know and you're attracting bus drivers when you need truck drivers. 
you want to be able to see the types of people that you're attracting, and the system will help you do that. It will also recommend people who you should reach out to directly who, may, who look like they fit your job. Um, and then, of course, recruiter usage. If you happen to have multiple recruiter licenses, you can see who best uses the tool, who sends out the most messages, whose messages are being viewed the most. That way you guys can work together with your team members to actually you know, construct content that works well for your audience. You can be very targeted in measuring. Maybe Justin Geller here sends the best messages to engineers, so he gives a presentation to the rest of the team on what to say. That's the type of cohesiveness we want within a team, and that's the type of data that we can use to make it happen. So as companies are putting together talent acquisition strategies, there's lots of things that come into play. Certainly talent brand is the most important from my perspective. Um, but a big piece of it is also being able to proactively source your own talent. And this is the tool that allows that to happen. So turn it back over. And thank you, guys. Thanks, Nicole. So um, LinkedIn Recruiter, very, very powerful. I am, uh, I'm a big fan. I, when I actually came over from the recruiting world and sat in front of LinkedIn Recruiter for the first time, I am completely blown away from it. Um, all of you guys, this is a good time to take a pause here. All of you guys should have a name on the back of your name tag um, that should be an account executive or somebody to reach out to. If you don't, if you have a business card with you, we can take those and make sure that you guys can get in contact with the right folks, um, those folks at home. Uh, we will follow up with the talent brand playbook with you guys as well, and um, we'll make sure that we have the right person get in contact with you guys. So Nicole showed us a little bit about how to actually measure uh, the LinkedIn recruiter activity and platform. One of the challenges that we've found has been how do you measure success within your brand, within your talent brand, within what you're doing out in the marketplace? How do you know what's working, what's not? And so what we've actually done is we've taken a look at some data. We've seen that only one out of three companies are measuring their employer brand in a quantifiable way. Last year around this time, we released something called Talent Brand Index. And what Talent Brand Index is, is it's a way to measure how your brand is doing on LinkedIn. And because I do not have a British accent and the person in this video does, we're going to let them tell you about Talent Brand and it will sound very, very smart. Employer branding has never been more critical than it is in today's talent economy. It can mean the difference between a candidate responding to your opportunities or passing them up. 83% of employers on LinkedIn believe their brand has a significant impact on their ability to hire great talent. But only one third of those employers regularly measure it. So how can you measure your brand? LinkedIn is finally making it simple with the Talent Brand Index. It's a powerful way to measure how attractive your company is to potential candidates on LinkedIn. Billions of interactions take place between professionals and employers on LinkedIn each year. We analyzed this data to identify what makes people interested in companies as places to work. First, within the millions of members on LinkedIn, we look at reach, or the number of people who are familiar with you as an employer. This includes people who view your employees' profiles or connect with them. Then we look at engagement, or the number of people who show an interest in your brand. This includes people who proactively engage your company by viewing your career page or company page, following your company, or viewing jobs. Your talent brand index is engagement divided by reach, and measures the percent of people who know about your company that also express an interest. In other words, how well you attract potential candidates in your talent pool. The higher your index score, the easier it is to attract the right professionals for your role. Your Talent Brand Index helps you understand how your brand stacks up against your peers, how your multiple talent brands are perceived by job function or geography, and how your talent brand changes over time. You can't manage what you can't measure. Find out your company's Talent Brand Index today and learn how to elevate your talent brand on LinkedIn by visiting talent.linkedin.com forward slash talent brand index or contact your LinkedIn representative. If you can't measure it, how do you know it's working?
in a nicer way. So uh, talent brand index, just briefly, again, looking at your brand strength on LinkedIn, you can actually track this over time and you can actually compare yourselves versus your competitors. So this is one of the perks of utilizing LinkedIn through the talent solutions group is essentially we have relationship managers that would work with you to track your talent brand, do quarterly business reviews and make sure that you guys understand where you sit in the marketplace and where you are today, where you want to get to, and how close we're coming to that. We can also segment off across different functions so that you guys have an idea of, okay, we're doing well in sales, engineering, not so hot. Let's see if we can switch some things and change some messaging or be more targeted in that space. So again, measure, engage, improve, and repeat. So back to the big takeaways briefly. Talent brand is vital to improving recruiting outcomes. How do we do there? OK. Kind of important, at least. Good. Every company, regardless of industry, location, and size, can harness the power of the talent brand. Thoughts? We get that, and we'll get more of that from our, our customers as well. And then social media level in the playing field like never before. So again, if we didn't hit on all of these things, please come and find us and let us know where we might have missed. Uh, and with much fanfare, hopefully, from everybody, we're going to bring up our customer panel now. We have uh, Melissa Hooven from Cornerstone On Demand, Susan Hollingshead from, uh, from our friends at Sungevity, and Meredith Weiland from uh, Heffernan. And Robert Rye is going to actually lead the discussion with these folks. And then we're going to open it up for questions. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jake. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Rye. I have the pleasure of working for LinkedIn as an enterprise account executive here in San Francisco. And it's my distinct honor to introduce you again to three amazing women, all of whom are LinkedIn clients and are having success within their organizations, their careers, and with their talent acquisition. And hopefully, um, you're now you know, going to get what you uh, came to hear, which is their real life experiences about uh, talent acquisition at their particular organizations. So I was going to start by asking uh, a very general question, really. But um, for any one of the three of you, or all of you, how have you seen talent acquisition evolve over the past several years? Since I'm arguably the oldest person sitting here. <laughs> oh, I forgot to give you the microphones. Um, I think the evolution over the last 10 years um, has been extraordinary. I mean, if you go back 10 years, social media played really little, if any, role in any of our recruitment efforts. Um, and we've gone from basically a hard print, kind of standard advertising, mode to something that's so totally different. It's all about look. It's all about social media. Um, it's all about how we come across as an employer, um, not only through ourselves, but through every one of our employer employees that anybody can connect to. So that's an enormous difference. Yeah, I think um, being able to uh, get access um, everything's at our fingertips now, and a platform like LinkedIn allows you the access to get to passive job seekers, allows you to make a company go global, allows you to attract talent globally, um, and it also creates an opportunity for a talent brand that demonstrates your company culture. Uh, all those are, were things that were not very present unless you visited a company in person before. So now you're able to have an online presence that people can interact with and engage with. In addition to that, for my industry, which is insurance, we were very reliant on recruiters. And there's a huge expense tied to that. And if it wasn't recruiters, it was referrals. But with the LinkedIn platform, all of a sudden we had this tool. We could do what the recruiters do, but we could do it better because we know ourselves better than they do. And so for us, that was really transformative from a, both a financial standpoint, but also in finding better candidates. Thank you very much. How does your talent brand fit into your overall talent acquisition strategy? And what do you do to you know, promulgate that brand? Well, we're, so we're Heffernan Insurance Brokers. Um, we, a couple years ago, came out with a new tagline for ourselves that says, you're different. 
And really, that was a reflection of us. We're different. We used to did a lot of surveys and realized we're a unique organization, and we wanted to let people know that we recognize that you're all unique individuals, and that was both for talent and as well as for clients. So we've made a number of different videos and so on, and we did one recently that says we're different. We posted it in a number of different places, including it's on our career page. And it just kind of gives you a little overview about the company, and it's fun, and it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. And I just did a, a recruitment search. I found a passive candidate that it seems like an excellent fit for an executive assistant position. She really wasn't interested. Um, I kind of had to you know, talk her through it and why, and this is who you already know at our company. And I could tell that because it tells me you know, who she's connected to at, at my own organization. And when she did get back to me and say, okay, yeah, I'll come in and talk to you, she said, you know, what got me was your video. And it really showed your culture. And when, you know, all this talk this morning about your brand, I thought, that is our brand. And that's what hooked this gal. And it's, it's little things like that that just keep reinforcing, you know, why getting yourself out there is so important, you know, for talent acquisition. Well, first, we're a company that is, uh, our basis is learning and development and talent acquisition. So Cornerstone has, you know, five or six different clouds that focus in um, giving us software for this type of uh, function in a company. So we actually kind of built out ours, so we kind of practiced what we preached. And so we put out our whole career page. We tied it all into our back-end systems. We bought all the LinkedIn packages and kind of created this overall universal brand, even on the social channels. And so it reinforced what we create as products that we sell, but it also reinforced us as a brand and culture that we do empower people. We are living by the products that we create and that it's kind of a win-win situation for us on the both platforms of us. So. When, I, when I work with uh, organizations like those that are represented by people here in the room, oftentimes I get questions about the best way to navigate internally when it comes to introducing something new, like some of the concepts that, that LinkedIn brings to the table. I'm curious, how did you all come to become clients of LinkedIn, whether having an epiphany or perhaps facilitated by some of the uh, folks that work here? And then how do you navigate internally you know, to get the certain things you needed approved and, and show that this would be something that would be potentially advantageous? I think sometimes there's a struggle around that. Well, our story is probably the easiest. Um, we recruited the CMO at LinkedIn to come join us. <laughs> <laughs> so they must have a very strong brand. And, and that was actually part of our strategy. We were highly, highly focused on brand, both uh, company brand, product brand, and talent brand. And so we were able to get out ahead of the game. Um, we really started aggressively developing talent brand three and a half years ago. Um, and we knew that we were going to be growing very rapidly. Um, and so we needed a highly deployable, extremely economically efficient tool. Um, the good news is we've kind of evolved with you all. Every time you found a cool new thing to do, we found how good it is for us. So. Glad to hear that. So it's not only just about where you are today, but it's where you know, you're heading, right? And he's had little or nothing to do with those decisions since that time. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, one of the, the best things our CEO said was, you either have a culture by design or a culture by default. And so we had executive buy-in from the beginning. Also, we're a learning and development talent acquisition company. So our executive buy-in was 100% from the get-go. The other thing that he realized was that in order to continue growing at the 65% growth that we're doing is the investment into talent. And we utilize it through our own ATS, our own tools of social recruiting, and tying it into the platform like LinkedIn allowed us the accessibility to continue growing. And so executive buy-in for us was always, um, was always the front line. They were always very uh, engaged with what we were doing from acquiring talent and how we were maturing talent and what kind of programs we were doing around our talent. So we, we kind of had the easy game there for us. So. so you mentioned social recruiting. What other things is your organization doing you know, within the area of social recruiting outside of LinkedIn? We do Instagram. You can follow us on Instagram. We have Twitter feeds. My recruiters have twi Twitter feeds. Uh, we have our, our Facebook platform. Uh, I think we even have a Pinterest somewhere out there. Our marketing team is fantastic, so they're very engaged. And we work hand in hand with them to kind of join our efforts together. And, and Susan or Meredith, are you 
using things outside of LinkedIn as well? Uh, for recruiting specifically, no. Okay. Um, from a social media standpoint, you know, we try to touch on all the all the majors, and that's that's really how we got to LinkedIn in the first place was having a big social media push for the business as a whole, and then getting introduced to the recruitment piece of it and the careers page, and then it just kind of evolved from there. One of the tools that we use has worked with us, so that every time somebody goes to one of our employees' uh, pages, um, they'll get a pop-up ad that says, you know, work with us. Uh, do you want to do this? And so rather than us focusing our social media attention on HR and some of the recruiters who work for me, we really focus it on the employees, and we focus it on our founders. Um, and everybody tweets. Everybody fakes books. Um, we push it out there to them all the time. Um, and they're phenomenal advocates. Um, there's a very interesting correlation between some of these tools on LinkedIn and not only what we think um, is the sourcing that we do directly from LinkedIn, um, but also the rise in referral rates. Um, it's, I have some real interesting statistics I can share with you later in this period, but uh, they're highly correlated. And so we find the more that we engage our employees, as the social media connectivity tissue, um, the better we do overall. And just as a way of reminder, work with us is the slide that Jake had up earlier that showed when a person was visiting a profile page, there was an ad that appeared that says, come work with us at Sungevity or um, one of these other companies. And it's a great way to leverage literally existing traffic that's there today, that's interested in your organization, but maybe doesn't know that those opportunities are there. And this is people that are already connected to your existing employees. So they probably know of your organization, think of it in a positive light, and so forth. And you can very quickly learn from talking to any of the uh, folks in the room that represent LinkedIn exactly how many people are coming to those pages each month, what their background is, the companies they're coming from, and so forth. And oftentimes, companies are surprised. It's thousands of people per month. And just by putting a little ad in front of them to let them know of your opportunities, you're instantly leveraging literally social recruiting without very, very much effort. Yeah, one of the things I wrote down, I bring a cheat sheet up here, but we did the work with us campaigns. We did a bunch of the targeting ad campaigns and Harsh, it was great with working me on that. But one of the statistics that came back that I found was so interesting was that the majority of the followers and viewers of those campaigns or my company are from my competitors. <laughs> And then they listed out my competitors and where the percentages were coming from. So I thought that was, yeah. that's a really neat. Big data. It's, Big we data. capture a lot of useful data. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Melissa, share with me, you talked you talk to me a little bit earlier about the transition from heavy reliance on outside agencies, oh, yes. your own background, <laughs> and then coming to your organization and having to get them to, to make a change? Yeah, so um, I came from external search. Um, I came from executive search and also technology search in Los Angeles and San Francisco and came on to join Cornerstone. Cornerstone was at a point where their talent acquisition team was very little and light and that they were in a desperate need to develop their department and their strategy as we were continuing the 65% growth year over year globally. So we went from heavily relying on external recruiters, where your return rate on it, also we noticed some retention issues. People would start and then leave after six months or, or nine months, and they were coming from recruiters. And we were paying uh, absorbent amounts of, of fees, and so one of the things I came in and said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and interview every external recruiter because I'm, I was a pretty good one. So if they meet my standards, then <laughs> I will work with you. And so I narrowed it down to about three for each specific group. And then we started slowly moving off external recruiters as we started to engage more with platforms like LinkedIn and social recruiting. And so we saw the, the trend go down as far as our dollars and using those dollars wisely to build our talent brand and our company culture and the engagement tools on the web. And so that was a nice, nice transition for us. And now we have control and design over our own talent brand, especially with LinkedIn. And you mentioned having people who understand the culture, yeah. owning the process, yeah. has a lot more congruence yeah. in terms of that cultural. He mentioned earlier about your biggest brand ambassadors are your employees. 
So if you can engage with them, they're better brand ambassadors than an external recruiter that's pitching your company and 25 other companies and is chasing the paycheck. So it's really important for that talent brand and also to uh, engage your employee staff for talent brand ambassadors as opposed to external agencies. And I thought of that when Jake mentioned you know, transformational change because we all think of that as being something very big, which makes you also think it's very hard. But in fact, that's a transformational change in culture Absolutely. just by taking a few steps and, and starting to own that process. Yeah. yeah, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of saved just from external fees. And Meredith, I know I see you shaking your head. And well, it, for my organization, it was a really easy um, argument to win. We were a sales organization, and so our leaders are either still salespeople or former salespeople. And for them, it's all about revenue and bottom line and what's affecting it. And you know, to them, HR and admin and recruiting, that's all overhead cost. And they always complain about it. And so it was simple for me, <laughs> you guys all do it too, to add up what were our external recruitment costs, what was the retention on that, how much in salary had we paid to these people who didn't even work here anymore, and compare that to this is how much LinkedIn's going to cost us. And they all, well, why aren't we doing this now? I mean, they looked at me like, why haven't we talked about this? Like, I'm the idiot in the room. <laughs> so it, it was just, it was, a, it was one of those situations for an HR person to walk out and, and get that win. And when somebody said earlier, you know, who's ever walked up to their CEO and said, give me a pile of money and they give it to you? I actually did get that pile of money. And you know, it was a relatively small pile of money compared to what we'd been spending in the past. And it's, it's really paid off. What about other things that your recruiters are able to achieve that they weren't previously, whatever those might be, in terms of now having this power like the recruiter or some of the other aspects of LinkedIn? Well, I think it's being able to go through that profiling process that she demonstrated. And you know, starting broad and then narrowing it down, narrowing it down. And we had to learn that. And you know, just recently, I was trying to do one, and I was having a terrible time. And our relationship manager, Jesse, you know, okay, start over again. And just to go through it, and then being able to tweak it, and look at the results, and tweak it again. You no, know, go back, start over. But to have that control over it, instead of if you're working with a recruiter, they send you some, you look at the resumes, and you're like, this isn't what I want. This is what I want. Oh, okay, I'll get back to you. You can do it yourself, and you can do it all you know, within seconds. So it's, it's just it's so powerful. And again, you know, as Melissa was saying, because you know your company. You know what you need. You know the personality of the hiring manager you know, so much better than an external person. You can also develop, I think, a very specific voice and a very specific look for different populations. We're using five career pages currently. Um, so we have one pitch to software people. We have another pitch to inside sales people. We have another pitch to our field retail reps. Um, that's been really effective because people like to be talked to in their own look and their own voice. And we've seen our talent index continue to grow since we added those additional uh, career pages, which was something we did just at the beginning of this year. But we've been really pleased with the ability to make that sort of individualized pitch and the effect that it's had on the quality of people coming forward. Um, I'll give you some numbers because I think that this is a good one. Um, I run a team of five and that's my global operation and one in EMEA. Um, I have three internal uh, full-time here in Santa Monica and then I have one that's a contractor and we were able to hire 200 people in five months, that's just new headcount. That's all I have to say. <laughs> so, and that was a, it was it was huge for us because we were on this growth pattern and we were adding about 35 people per month. And in order to keep up with that growth, we had to a have tools, we had to stay focused, and we had to get a strategy together. And all these little parts of what we're talking about here play in play into that strategy, the overall picture of talent acquisition. How does success look a year or two or three out, whether it be you know, specific to LinkedIn or just within your own organizations? And if it's specific to LinkedIn, are there things that you, you know, if you just imagine, oh, if LinkedIn could only do this, it would take me to the next level. Maybe I open a Pandora's box, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> but. 
One of the things LinkedIn could do for me um, <laughs> <laughs> is to give us a glossary. You all have grown so much um, that I think my biggest challenge with LinkedIn per personally is to keep the names of all the different product features straight. Mm -hmm. Um, I keep saying, I just want a little index so I can remember what the name of that one was. Um, but seriously, I think this in iteration around individualization, about being able to parse the message to the appropriate audience, about being able to connect our page to other things, um, because for us, our product is our mission, our mission is our brand, um, and our employees are the face of that brand. So. The more visualization, the more focused we can be, um, the more effective we become. Uh, we recently had a huge challenge where we'd actually finished this year's staffing ramp, or what we thought would be this year's staffing ramp, <laughs> which already upped our population by about 30 percent. Um, and then we took on a couple new channel partners, and the request came across, oh, well, you know, great. Let's add 30 percent to the entire population of the company in five weeks, in five states. Wow. Um, I honestly believe that if we hadn't understood this platform and a couple others as well as we did, we could never have accomplished that because it gave us tremendous ability to differentiate nationally, which is, as many of you know, not an easy thing to do if you're going to do it quickly. So I think you know those kinds of things are the tools we're looking for in the future. Okay, so I'll make a note, the glossary. Glossary. <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. <laughs> Melissa. Um, the, the, the great thing is as we're evolving, we're going global. And so LinkedIn has been a great, great network for us to use as we're expanding into regions that we have, we're not very familiar with. And so LinkedIn has been um, great as far as moving into new regions. And so that, that's where we're evolving as a company. We're going global into the MIA, the Asian Pacific, and the Latin American regions. And so LinkedIn will be a, a huge benefit for us and a tool for us as we start to evolve into the new markets. So, um, for me, success is a little bit different scale. Mm -hmm. We're a regional company. I mean, we have some things out of state, but we're more regional. We only have 400 employees, and we're also a very, I don't know. There, we still have a lot of people that are change resistant. Some of these managers, so they like it, but uh, I'm not quite sure. So, for me, success is getting all of these managers and with each success story proving to them this is the way to do it and to embrace it and there's a, I have a couple holdouts you know well I really like this recruiter I'm like hey it's on your budget you're also contributing to paying for this too but you know just step by step so in a couple years where I want to see us is really like 99 percent of our hiring is done either through you know referral employee referrals or through LinkedIn and seeing our retention rates really being much higher and just really taking advantage of this branding that we've worked hard on from a, a business standpoint and really utilizing it to its full capacity for our, our hiring standpoint. And I would encourage all of you to actually look at their um, career pages of these three companies because they're fantastic. The videos they have and the way they've, uh, and you saw Sungevity profile the most, but just the way they're able to speak to their culture and, how you, and project that uniqueness, um, it's, it's fascinating. And it really, it really, you know, kind of emotionally hooks you and pulls you in. So I would imagine that some of you might have uh, questions you would like to ask our panel. So we have microphones around the room, and if you have a, a question, please feel free to step up to uh, the microphone and ask away. And same for any of the folks on our live stream. You can chat the questions, and somehow with magic, people will get those questions to me, and I'll be happy to uh, ask on your behalf. So um, who would like to be the first? That's always the hardest one to, uh, to get. Nobody? OK. This is a question uh, for Melissa. You mentioned that your recruiters all run Twitter accounts. Yeah. So besides the job pitch, you know, hey, we have an opening, what else are they doing? And it applies to LinkedIn status updates as well as Twitter. What are they doing to engage the potential job seeking audience other than just the job pitch? Yeah, um, what we try to do is um, there's nine, way, nine reasons to work for Cornerstone. If you followed my feed on, on LinkedIn, for like nine days after a certain holiday, we did, you know, every day we, we pitched a reason to work for Cornerstone. We have an Instagram feed where we don't sell jobs. We post pictures of our staff um, at a beach day or at community events where you can start to sync up of, of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, our Twitter, um, excuse me, our 
Facebook feed also shows a lot of our internal company, company culture activities. So yeah, we're, yes, we have a lot of jobs, we're hiring like crazy, but I'd rather everyone get to know our company and feel good about wanting to work for Cornerstone before I even talk to you about an opportunity. Um, there's a lot more about Cornerstone than just the job. So I hope that answers it. We also get a lot of um, national and international uh, press. So we use tweets constantly to put that press out there because that press, again, is part of the brand. It's part of what makes people see, wow, this company's really doing some amazing things. It's very unusual. Um, it's very attractive. And so it's not just recruitment per se, but news and this constant feed of news about the company that makes it an exciting, dynamic appeal. And ours, it, it's all incorporated. So it's the business as well as the recruitment. And so there's kind of a schedule. So we'll have, you know, let's say three each week that are about business-related things. Because, again, for, for us, it's, it, we want people who know the business. So we want them to know we know the business. And so we're feeding information not just to our you know, prospects and clients, but to these potential candidates. And then we have once a week, we highlight an employee's dog. And so there's always something about a dog because we, you know, bring your dogs to work. That's okay with us. Mm -hmm. And then we always have something too about a social event that we have going on, you know, whether it's a particular branch or we're doing some, some sort of community activity or whatever. But, you know, with social media, as it was mentioned before, if you're going to do it, you got to go all in. Yeah. You got to keep it fresh. And so when we first got into it, it was kind of spotty and we'd look at something and it's so stale and you thought, well, this, you, you can't do this. So we have a social media director now, and she just, that's all she does, is just she keeps this content flowing to keep the interest. Are you able to track what comes back from the outreach? You know, that's, I think, the metric um, in general that social is hard to track. I mean, even for companies trying to do a social media campaign. So it's the same for us. It's hard to track. We can see it in numbers that like LinkedIn gives us as our follower base start to increase as mm -hmm. we start to get more engaged or more get more involved. Um, and we start to see our Facebook numbers page likes start to increase and you know our Twitters get shared and, and those types of things. Um, but you can't really measure it. Like she said, you got to go all in and at some point it clicks and it kicks in and it becomes something. At first, you feel like you're just tweeting, and it's like an, an you know, <laughs> no one's in the audience, right? But I think if you go all in, it starts to gradually increase this awareness, and the awareness gets to the people that you eventually want to attract into your company. And we found that there's a question we ask in every interview about how they found us, what mm -hmm. their experience was, what did they feel was attractive, some of the things that are like I think some of the things that Jake had on that one slide. Um, and we do the same thing once they've come on board because sometimes they'll say it a little differently once they're on board than they might as a candidate. Um, and it's really the juxtaposition of that information that is really helpful for us. It tells us a lot about what's working and what's not. I, I can share one little statistic and that is since we started using LinkedIn both for the business and for recruiting, we've seen our followers increase. And we've, we still have Facebook. We put things on Facebook as well. But I, my social media director just shared with me that we now have three times as many followers on LinkedIn than we do on Facebook. Oh, and I attribute a lot of that to the work we've done with, with LinkedIn and, and continuing to keep things fresh and push things out there. So it, it does work, um, but it is hard to, to nail it down more specifically sometimes than that. Actually, one of the things that we think is interesting is seeing how many candidates check us out individually yeah. before they come in for yeah. interviews. Um, because we're pretty big on what do you know about Sungevity, that, that that's an important measure for us. Um, and they're getting much more sophisticated. They come in and say, well, I looked at your profile, and I saw Terrence, and oh, I know your CEO did this. That's a pretty important measure, we think, of how LinkedIn functions for us. Yeah, and you wouldn't stand a chance of getting very far in the interview process at LinkedIn if you didn't uh, know, you know, <laughs> Damien's background at MIT or my boss or whatnot before you came into the interview. It's really become an expected thing to look for some commonality and, and some areas where you can, you know, map yourself to the, to the um, organization's culture and goals. So. And it starts to get fun because we didn't have these tools a couple years ago. So now we get to engage just on a different level and we get to be heard. So it becomes fun if you 
choose to interact with it. So especially with tools like LinkedIn. We haven't talked specifically about passive talent, but when you talk about engagement, it lends itself to thinking about, well, who do you really want to engage with? People that are working somewhere else, and if you're looking for salespeople or technical talent, you know, they're likely to be people that are, that are employed if they're, if they're good. So um, any thoughts about specific you know, uh, search for passive people specifically or how the organization positions itself to take advantage of passive candidates? Well, this, this EA that I'm hoping to hire I mean, when I looked at her profile and it showed that she was a second to me, and I don't know her. Mm -hmm. So, I, okay, who is she connected to? And she's connected to a guy that works in one of our San Francisco offices. And so I sent him an email. Hey, how do you know her? What do you know about her? And, you know, she's got this great profile. And so just immediately to get that kind of feedback that he wasn't prepared for me to ask. Mm -hmm. And so then I had sent her an in-mail, kind of waited, and then he happened to see her at a party over the weekend. He's like, oh yeah, you're probably gonna hear from you know, somebody in HR at my company. She's like, oh, you know, and so they had this conversation. And he talked about how much he loves working for the company. And I mean, that just was, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just like see somebody, I guess, in the past in a magazine and think, gosh, it'd be great if they worked here. Or that, that column in the Chronicle where they say, who's moved recently or whatever, and you think, oh, we could target them, but who do I know that knows that person? Well, now LinkedIn tells you. Mm -hmm. And then even if it's a third connection, it, it doesn't tell you, you know, connect all the dots, but it starts giving you a path. Well, here's, here's somebody who is a second. And so you can go to that person and say, hey, look in your network. Who knows this person? And you can start connecting these dots. And then it's like in sales, there's cold calls, right? Everybody hates cold calls. You want to have a warm call. And this helps make it warm. Because I, when I talk to her, I'm like, oh, yeah. So I understand you know Ryan. She's like, yeah. So I'm at a party. I'm like, how about that? So it's, I don't know, it's just, I'll, it just, it just seems a little bit more um, personal. I hope she's watching. I hope, well, I don't know. That'd be awesome. Um, you know, my network, you know, everyone in talent acquisition think that, you know, we have good networks. We've, we've built it. We spent years in it. We've matured our networks. Um, but LinkedIn's got 238 million in their network. So from a passive perspective, you just want the access. And that just grows your network. And... Most, the majority of our searches, about 80% of them, are, we're trying to find passive people. We want skilled workers with specific talents that can contribute to a certain role in our opportunity in our company. And so our talent pool is the 80% that's passive. And so I'd rather be fishing in a $238 million pool than mine. So. Uh, we did, in the last seven months, four C-level searches. Uh, two of them I did as retained search. Two of them we did strictly through LinkedIn passive recruitment. Um, I have to say that the cost, the speed to fill, and the quality of the applicants was much higher in our passive search efforts than it was in retained recruitment. Um, and I apologize to the retained recruiters in the office or in the room, but I think that you know it, it's it's a very changing world out there. And I think more people are looking to have those conversations with a company more directly uh, than through a third party. And coming from retained executive search, one of my biggest tools was LinkedIn Recruiter. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, well, thank you. I would welcome the opportunity to continue this dialogue uh, for much longer. I think we're running out of time. Does anybody want to take a shot at asking a question before these wonderful ladies are uh, excused from their role here? Yeah. So what I'm understand if I'm understanding correctly and being in the valley for so many years that the trans transformation is not just taking place from company to company but it's really taking place across the board for some folks in that it's strengthening the the team the teamwork that goes into between the disconnects that had been in the past between the sales folks the engineers folks and all that that it's actually bringing some strengths um, and actually um, making the core um, of working in a company and kind of like the leadership and it's making um, it more fun and more kind of something to look forward to every day to come to work. Yeah. Is that correct? Is that what I'm getting? If you come to Las Vegas, I'm doing a presentation there about engaging around mission. But one of the things we found is how much our employees enjoy the videos, enjoy the pictures that we use of them. Um, they can hardly wait to see what comes next. and. I think in a very real way, it gives them the sense even more than um, many of the other things that we do, that they truly own a piece of the rock. 
um, that they are the company, that it's not just the CEO's picture that's out there, but all of theirs. One of, just for that point, one of the great things Cornerstone did this year is we didn't, we stopped using stock photos. And instead, we did a whole photo shoot and created our own stock library with our own employees. And so every time you use our product or you get marketing material about our products, it's our employees. And with LinkedIn, people being able to put on their profile that they're the senior director of talent acquisition at Cornerstone On Demand, and when they click Cornerstone On Demand, it goes to our company page. There's a sense of um, uh, feeling a part of something. So um, our employees population loves, loves being um, attached to things that we're doing. I think that's a great idea. I love that. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to comment on, and again, as an HR person, and sometimes you're not always getting the attention of the right people, and this did help grab attention, and it does help bring some of those decision makers um, closer to the HR world and appreciate more. So if you're in one of those positions in HR where you feel like you're just always banging your head against the wall, this is a way, if you're trying to bring some value, you know, if you're thinking about what SHRM says or, you know, NCHRA says, you know, this is something you can bring to the table that adds serious value to your organization and really can help impact um, profit, you know, by bringing in the right people, but also doing it in a really cost-effective way. And one other thing, not only do our um, passive job seekers or people who are looking for a job look at our LinkedIn profile, it's also people who are looking at for, to buy our product. Mm -hmm. So it's also our customers. So it's nice to also engage in that way. And just to build on what Susan was saying, she's referring to being a presenter at our upcoming user conference. It's called Talent Connect. It's going to be at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, October 15th to 17th. You're all invited. Um, you would get the opportunity to hear uh, folks like Susan and others in uh, similar roles. There's multiple tracks depending on your area of specialty and, and what you'd like to learn. Um, and it would be a way to continue uh, this dialogue. So unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Susan, Melissa, and Meredith. We appreciate it very much. And I'm going to bring up Damien to close. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you very you much. Very much. That was, uh, Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're over time, so I've been asked to wrap quickly. So uh, two things for the folks in the room. One, uh, look on the back of your name card. You should see your LinkedIn representative. Uh, if you don't, just uh, ask me um, or any of the folks with the orange lanyards in the room. Uh, the other thing is please take a look at the Employment Brand Playbook. Uh, there's a lot more detail in there than obviously we're able to go to in an hour and a half long session. Uh, should take you through step by step. And for folks on the... Uh, on the web, uh, if you'd like to contact us, the easiest way to reach us is at talent.linkedin.com, and uh, there'll be a form there for you to fill out. So thank you very much, everyone, and I uh, look forward to speaking with you soon.